my cousins in South Carolina are now aware of who you are. My cousins in law are like um, calling me, like they're calling my wife, who's from Savannah, Georgia, and families in. Um, they were just in Savannah uh, yesterday. You, you brought it up. I wasn't going to mention Hillary, and I'm not going to talk long. But are we in, in this country in danger of creating essentially monarchs of political families? And is that danger? I think it is. Okay. Here's what the story is, in my view. Here is, you're putting your finger, although I disagree with you just a little bit. Okay. On a huge issue. Okay. All right. What does democracy mean? Democracy really means, it's not a complicated idea. It's everybody has input, everybody votes, right? Yeah. That's what it means. One person, one vote. What you got now is a economy which is largely rigged in the sense that almost all of the new wealth and income is going to the top 1%. Gotcha. Okay. And you have an incredibly unequal distribution of wealth. Gotcha. Okay? That's what the one reality. And then you got another reality. And the reality is that the folks who have the money, they're not putting that money under their mattress. They want political power. Gotcha. So as a result of this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision, billionaires can now buy elections. So they can spend as much money as they want. And that's what's happening. When you have one family, like the Koch brothers, yeah. it's an extreme right-wing billionaire family, they and a few of their friends are going to spend $900 million on this campaign. That is more money than the Democrats will spend, more money than the Republicans. What does that sound to you? Does that sound like democracy? Definitely is not. But it leads me to ask this. I have a lyric where I say, you know, could it be the man behind the man behind the man behind the throne? I consider you a good man with, with grand ideas. But that pessimism and apathy that seeps into my community, into the general American community, um, says don't go out and vote because whether those brothers buy Hillary or buy Trump or buy something, the seat's for sale. How do we, I don't want to say how do we know you're not for sale or the seat's for sale. How do we know the presidency of the United States is not bought and paid for to the point where the grand ideas that you have that could help and radically change this country won't get stifled because of the money? Well, first of all, every, even if, even if every speech that I give, that's what I say. I say, hey, do you think Bernie Sanders can do it alone? I can't. Let's be very clear about this. The powers that be, Wall Street, corporate America, the corporate media, campaign donors. Do you think if I go into the White House and I say, hey, you know, Wall Street, I got a great idea. I think you should pay a tax on speculation so that I can put all of our kids into college tuition free. What do you think they're going to say to me? Mike, hey, that's a great idea, Bernie. Why didn't we think of that idea? What they will do is go nuts, right? How do we beat them? You only beat them when all kinds of people stand up and say, you know what, you guys, you're all going to have to pay, pay a tax on speculation so that young people in America will have the opportunity to go to college. I can't do it alone. Yeah. No president. So to answer your question, I don't think I can do it alone. Gotcha. All right. But your good question is, how do we get people involved? And people have been disappointed. People have been hurt. And when you talk about the media watching the TV, I got to tell you, I think in many respects, media does a awful job in educating the American people about the reality of what's going on. And they got a reason to that, too. You know something about the media, I suppose. I do. I do. I do. I do. I, you talk about the education of, of, of Americans. You seem to be the only politician that wants a smarter constituency. You seem to be the only politician that wants a smarter constituency. And now I understand why, because you're one of the first politicians I've heard say it's a we. It, it is a collective of people. I believe that the people that got fired up in 2008 about Barack Obama, the ideas, not just the human being who's tall, slender, look cool, had a cool looking family like, you know, the Cosby Show Part 3. It, it really was he set forth ideas that we had been told for too long, don't wish that high. You are the natural evolution, I think, of our feeling. And I'm not saying he's part two of Barack Obama. In no way am I saying that. I'm not saying that he's here to collect, carry on a political campaign starting in 2008. No one's saying that. I'm saying that the feeling that I had of, of the hope and possibility of change, you have come and voiced an actual policy that you're willing to push through for all of us to get behind. And why aren't people seeing it that way by well, your... Mike, we are taking on the world. Gotcha. I mean, you know, we are, who we, we're taking on a corporate media, which is much more interested in, in looking at politics 
as a baseball game yeah. or as a soap opera yeah. rather than dealing with the real issues. Here, let me throw it out to you. You tell me if you've seen this on TV. As a result of technology, the average worker in America is producing a lot more, correct? Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Why is the person, everything being equal, earning less money? Good question. Very good question. Why is the United States the only major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people? Good question. It's a very good question. All right. Is it moral that the top one-tenth of one percent owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent? Absolutely not moral. All right. Do you hear that discussion on CNN and NBC? No. Not too often. So what we are trying to do, and I'm very proud, we're going to have a whole many thousands of people out here in Atlanta. You know, we have 27,000 people out in Los Angeles. Yeah. All right. People are beginning to hear it, but I'm not a fool, and I know you don't change this country overnight. But the main thing is, and let me repeat it, nothing happens unless people stand up. You know, I just visited Dr. King's center, yeah. all right? What was that whole thing about? You think he said, hey, I'm Dr. Martin Luther King, I'm a really smart guy, I'm a great orator, I'm gonna change the world? He was a profound organizer, correct? Yes, sir. That's what he did, and that's what we have to you do. You went to the King, you yes. went to the, the King Mark, you went to the, to the I Have a Dream Mark, you were there. And you have consistently, you organized with SNCC. Yeah. You did like, that's a pretty, I, don't I know, it makes it seem like ancient history. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that is, that, I, on some rap language, that's some bomb shit. Like, that is, that is absolutely Look, this is dope. what we felt. We were in the North. We were in Chicago. I was gotcha. a student at the University of Chicago. What we saw, uh, if I can use some bomb shit, is we saw our friends getting the shit kicked out of them and getting beaten to hell. Gotcha. All right, so we tried to get some money. They were the brave ones, not us. We got some money there. And in Chicago, what we worked on is the fact that the school that I went to, a great prestigious university, turns out that they own segregated housing. How's that? So you know what we did? We'd send a black couple in to an apartment. They go in and say, hi, do you have any apartments available? Say, no. Sorry, we just don't. An hour later, we sent the white couple in. Oh, yeah, let me show you the three apartments that we have available. So we kind of exposed that. We made an impact. We got involved in segregated schools in Chicago. But the issue that I love most about Dr. King is not just that he helped lead the civil rights movement and destroy segregation and so forth. This man was an incredibly courageous man. You know why he was courageous? If you were sitting, in a sense, all the media, everybody loved you, and you look at what you did, you got the Voting Rights Act, and you desegregated the South. What did he do next? He, he went, preached against the war in Vietnam. That's right. And, and poverty. That's he talks exactly about poverty right. And, poverty. No. and then everyone turned their back on and him. And they said, you know what they broke. said to him? They said, you are an African-American leader. Your job is to worry about civil rights. Who the hell are you talking about the war in Vietnam? Why are you talking about distribution of wealth? But because this guy was a brilliant guy, and this is what I love about him. He began, his mind grew and grew and grew. That's a smart person. You know what I mean? You don't stay in the same place your whole life. Absolutely. And he began to understand. Yeah, so we broke down segregation at a lunch counter. Absolutely. What the hell difference does it mean if you can't afford the hamburger? Absolutely. If you can't afford to send your kid to school? Absolutely. And if you're talking about nonviolence, and the United States and the war in Vietnam was a major perpetuator of violence, you're a hypocrite if you don't talk about it. He was not a hypocrite. And that this, is an extraordinary man. And this is what... I have wanted to get to. King is often, and, and it's, it's no, it's not by accident we're in a barbershop. And it's not only because I own the barbershop and it's a great business promotional opportunity. Barbershops seem to be the only place in my life that black men in particular have been able to speak the truth and not worry about getting killed. Um, it's a place where beyond black men, working class men can come speak the truth without worrying about the boss cutting them off at the job. A lot of union organizing started happening in the back of a barbershop or whiskey house, you know. Um, you have been, besides Alex Johnson, who was a white woman, my friend and mentor, besides James Orange, who was an organizer with Dr. King, is featured in that movie um, they did about Selma, um, besides Joseph Lowry, besides Andrew Young, the people that I've met that I know from the Civil Rights Movement, you're the only person who has dared to talk about Dr. King's connectivity um, or connecting war and poverty, with segregation and racism, with the economy, um, with workers' rights, with women's rights. You're the only one in my 40 years that I've seen do this on a national stage. Where was Dr. King when he was assassinated? He was in Memphis. Doing what? He was supporting a union effort Absolutely. to improve Absolutely. wages and working conditions Absolutely. for people who were terribly exploited. That's Absolutely. what he was doing. Absolutely. And what was he working on? What was the big project that he was working on in the last months of his life? A poor people's march. Absolutely. Okay? That was not just African Americans. 
That was whites. That was Hispanics, and Native and Americans. That's, and that's exactly what I'm getting to. You have been the only candidate that I have seen able to connect people who were once disconnected in this way. And I believe the disconnection is something that is orchestrated. I believe it's sure something it that's encouraged. I believe it's something that for the last at least 40, 50 years, there has been a political agenda to make sure that people choose teams. I often speak at colleges, and the number one thing I tell kids is they brought me here to talk about racism and to talk about police brutality because they know that's my box. I'm a black guy. I have to think about those things on a daily basis. But what I need you to do today, and I tell kids this, is to tell yourself as you come in the door, I'm going to put my team to the side. And I'm going to look at how my team is interconnected with these other teams and how can we as individuals Absolutely. be Absolutely. different, Absolutely. be different and help each Let other. Let me tell you a story about that one, Mike. Gotcha. In the 1950s, what state in this country had the lowest paid white workers? What state? Take a guess. I would imagine Georgia or Alabama. Try Mississippi. That makes sense. Okay. What did the whole system tell these white workers who were the lowest paid white workers in the United States of America? In other words, these workers were being exploited. Yeah. What they said is, you can go to that water fountain and drink, and the black guy can't. You can go to that bathroom, you can go to that restaurant. Man, you got it good. Yeah. Meanwhile, you're paying, we're paying you nothing. So you divided blacks from whites. In this case, whites from blacks. Absolutely. And this is what they always do. Then they go and they say, See that woman up there? She's an uppity woman. She wants your job, man. You're not going to let that woman take your job. You got to divide from her. And that guy's gay over there, man. You got to hate him. Going to destroy your marriage because he's gay. Got to hate him. Oh, and there's a person who speaks with a Spanish, you know, a little bit Spanish. Came from Mexico. Just supposed to hate that man. You're not going to work with those people. That has been what the ruling class has done over and over again. Why? Because they understand when we come together, you fight for decent wages. When you fight for education for your kids, you can fight to strengthen social security. We win, hands down. Yeah. But if they divide us up, they win. It's amazing, man, that the Democratic Socialist guy uses the word we so much. And, you know, everyone else is, is saying the I or the your. You know, it's I have this or it's your problem. I am. Um, you know, I, I just wish, man, that at, I wish to stay as angry as you. You know, there are days where I... I just say, well, you can be relaxed. You're gonna, you, you know, you're gonna retire middle class. You know your kids are okay, and yet I find a new reason to get angry every year. And I used to think that it was gonna kind of taper off. You know, I was gonna, I tell myself I'm gonna retire to Jamaica in ten years, but I know it's a lot. I know that whenever this thing I do called rapping is over and singing and dancing, that I'm gonna be angrily shouting out of someone's right. office in that's Atlanta. That's being human. Yeah. If you see stuff that's bad and you don't respond with, what did King call it, the fierceness of, the urgency of the moment or something. Yeah. You know, uh, then you're not alive. So don't lose that anger.